ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله so we left off last time at the statement of Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And we mentioned that this statement of testification, the shahada, La ilaha illallah, it has two pillars. It is made up of two pillars. And those two pillars are affirmation and negation. And that tawheed, it cannot be complete except uh, with the presence of those two pillars. So if one of those two pillars is present and the other one is not, then tawheed is deficient, it is not correct or accurate. For tawheed to be accurate and correct, both affirmation and negation must be present. And that's what is evident within the statement, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha, that there is no deity worthy of worship. In truthfulness, illallah. There is the affirmation, accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we mentioned that there are seven uh, conditions to La ilaha illallah. Those seven conditions are Mm, I think that's the correct. So the seven which are mentioned, the seven conditions for this is the firstly ilm. The first one which is mentioned is knowledge. Knowledge is clear that the statement of La ilaha illallah it, 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 within it must be encompassed knowledge, meaning you have to understand what you are saying. And that's what's going to be mentioned later on as well. And the affair of knowledge is well known. The statement of Al Imam al Bukhari is well known. In his chapter, Al-Ilm Qabl Al-Qawli Wal Amal, that knowledge comes before statements and actions. So, before a person is, be- be- is able to make statements with regards to the religion or otherwise, and before a person is able to act in any way, you need to have understanding and knowledge of how you are going to act and what is correct and what is not correct. So, similarly, here with this Shahada, the testification, you need to have knowledge. Knowledge of its meanings, knowledge of what it encompasses, knowledge of the uh, foundations that are comprised within the statement of La ilaha illallah. That's clear. Knowledge is clear. After that, yaqeen. Yaqeen, which is certainty. Certainty again. Meaning that a person when he says La ilaha illallah, this testification, this shahada, he must be, he must have this certainty within his heart of its truthfulness, and the certainty in his heart concerning its correctness. Not that a person he says the la ilaha illallah, he says the testification, and then he still has doubts in his heart. Who can think of an ayah in the Quran which indicates that meaning? That the believers are the ones who say the la ilaha illallah, etc., and then they don't have any doubts. Mm. Uh-huh. The first part is enough as an evidence anyway That إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَاسْتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا They don't have any doubt ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Then they don't have any doubt They don't have any uh, weakness in their heart with regards to the certainty of this uh, shahada. So the believers are the ones who believe in Allah. They believe in the messenger and then they don't have any shakiness in their heart afterwards. They don't have this doubt in their heart afterwards. And that's the meaning of this here now, yaqeen. Certainty. That when you say this shahada, la ilaha illallah, you have that certainty in your heart with regards to its truthfulness. Not like some of the people they say that, who knows, on the day of judgment we'll find out whether we were right or not. That's incorrect. We believe with certainty the correctness of this religion, with certainty the correctness of the revelation. And so that is a pillar which is mentioned here now, yaqeen, to have that certainty and definitiveness. Then also you have ikhlas. Ikhlas. Surely everybody can think of evidences for ikhlas. Sincerity. So some evidences with regards to sincerity and the importance of sincerity in the religion. 
So ayat in the Quran like this that indeed the true sincere religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Others Indeed all of your actions are by your intentions Or indeed all of your actions are judged in accordance to your intentions And that's like the example of the two people who pray in the mosque We mentioned before two people that come and pray in the mosque And there's no difference between the two of them at all They pray perfectly in accordance to the sunnah One of them though his reward is high The other one is almost non-existent Why? If they are both praying in an identical manner You can't spot the difference Because one of them he's praying with sincerity in his heart for the sake of Allah the other one is praying either to show off or he can't be bothered, he just wants to leave and pray. He wants to pray and leave. So the difference between them, even though their action is the same, is what's in their hearts. Their hearts, what comprise, what is uh, within their hearts, that makes the difference between the reward of their action and the lack of it. Also, other things. So, similarly, this ayah also, they were not commanded except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely upon this religion. Also, Other aspects that can be mentioned as well. All acts of worship are based upon sincerity and following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Al-ikhlas and al-mutaba'ah. Sincerity and following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So sincerity is a foundational aspect of all aspects of worship. A foundational point, a building block of all aspects of worship. All types of worship. And at the head of all of those types of worship, at the head of everything, is the testification of La ilaha illallah. The testification of Tawheed. So that's Ikhlas. Sidq. What would you say about that? Truthfulness. You can't be like that. Allah has not been good. Like they, they said to La ilaha illallah, but in their hearts they had something different. Sorry, that comes into it. It's linked to the previous point as well of Al Ikhlas. And it comes into this point of uh, Sidq as well. Now the munafiqeen, they went against these uh, pillars. They went against these conditions. Al-Ikhlas, they never had it. Sidq, they never had it in reality. So all of these things, they are linked to that point. It's correct that a person, he has to have sincerity in his heart. He has to be truthful in his heart. He has to believe in the truthfulness of the shahada itself. Mahabba, love. What could you say about that? The importance of that. All acts of worship are built upon three. Uh, that's it, that's it, Raja. Same thing, same thing, yeah. So, all acts of worship are built upon three things love, fear, and hope. So, love is one of the foundational pillars of worship, also. That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this love in your heart, the love for the Creator. And all acts of worship are built upon that love, fear, and hope. And Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they always take the middle path within those three. They always take the middle path between the love, the fear, and the hope. So now that you go too far onto the side of fear as the Khawarij they did, now that you go too far onto the side of hope as the Murji'a they did, and now that you go too far on the aspect of love as the Sufis they did. But instead you keep it all in a balance and that's why some of the scholars they said that these three aspects are like a bird. Love is the head, fear and hope are the two wings. You need all three for the bird to fly. If you only have the head and no wings, the bird doesn't fly. If you only have one wing and the other one is missing, the bird doesn't fly. So all three of those have to be in balance. So at the head of them is love also. So mahabba. In qiyad, submission. What could be said about that? Islam itself. What does Islam mean? Al-Islam. That submission. Al-Inqiyad is similar to that. Inqiyad is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Submission to the commandments of Allah Submission to the prohibitions Not falling into them It is a type of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Inqiyad Following the commandments of Allah Staying away from the prohibitions of Allah That's obviously one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah Which we'll come to in a minute as well It will be explained how that is encompassed within it Al-Qabul Acceptance That really summarizes everything we've just said Al-Qabul, acceptance, and that's clear again With everything which is knowledge, uh, certainty, sincerity, truthfulness, love, uh, submission, and then acceptance The other seven pillars, here the Sheikh doesn't really go into them in detail The purpose isn't to go into them in detail here However, there is a book by Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabiri 
And I think it's in English now. So that book, you can get it to research this in more detail, these seven pillars and the evidences for all of the seven pillars, ayat from the Qur'an, a hadith from the sunnah, which explain these seven pillars in more detail. And as the scholars have said, the point isn't to have just memorized these seven pillars, know the list of the seven, what they are, but the point is to be able to understand how to implement these seven. How to implement these seven. And most of it is clear. Knowledge, certainty, sincerity, the, the conditions are clear how they would be linked to Tawheed and how they have to form the foundation of your statement of La ilaha illallah. The Shaykh then says, the actualization of La ilaha illallah. How do you actually implement La ilaha illallah? What is the implementation or the actualization of La ilaha illallah? We've already mentioned it. The implementation and the actualization of La ilaha illallah is Tawheed and Shirk. That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon Tawheed, the affirmation, and you negate all other aspects of worship, all other deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you do not worship Allah upon anything other than what He has revealed. That is the actualization and the implementation of La ilaha illallah. So the Shaykh says, وَحَقُّ هَذِهِ الْكَلِمَةِ And the right of this statement, when you make this statement, it has rights. And from amongst the rights of this statement is, هُوَ فِعْلُ الْوَاجِبَاتِ وَتَرْكَ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ that you fulfill the commandments, you implement the commandments, and you stay away from the prohibitions. That's from the rights of the statement. When you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, the statement, the testification, the shahada, it's not just a statement that you say and then you forget about it. But it's a statement that you make, and then as a part of that statement, here the Shaykh says now, the rights of it are that you fulfill the commandments. You act out and you implement the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you stay away from the prohibitions, those things which are haram. Then the Shaykh says, فَائِدَتُهَا وَثَمَرَتُهَا What's the benefit of it? That's the right of it. That's what it indicates and what it uh, requires from you. La ilaha illallah requires from you that you fulfill the commandments of Allah and you stay away from the prohibitions of Allah. That's the rights of la ilaha illallah. What's the benefit and the fruits of la ilaha illallah? The Shaykh says, سَعَادَةُ الدَّارَيْنِ It is the happiness of both lives. The happiness of this dunya and the happiness of the hereafter. That is the fruits of La ilaha illallah. For a person who implements La ilaha illallah, understand its meaning, then that one, the fruits he achieves from that, the results he gets from that, is happiness in this world and happiness in the hereafter. But that is, that is only for the one who says La ilaha illallah, Knowing its meanings and acting upon its uh, uh, necessities or that which is required from it. It's not just to say it. La ilaha illallah isn't just to say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And you think that's it, I'm finished, I've said it. That's not the correct understanding. The correct understanding is that you say it. You have to say it. You have to know the meaning of it. You have to understand what this means. La ilaha illallah. La ma'abuda bihaqqin illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship and truthfulness except Allah. Meaning, you then understand what uluhiya is. That you're going to single out all of your acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Big, small, from the heart, upon your tongue, upon your limbs. All of that is within the meanings of la ilaha illallah. So you understand all of those meanings. You say it, you understand all of those meanings. And even that's not sufficient. Just to say it and to understand the meanings. But to say it, to understand the meanings. And then to act upon it also. To act upon that which it necessitates. Because La ilaha illallah obviously necessitates certain things. And from amongst those things that it necessitates, the head of them clearly, the general meaning of it, is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon sincerity. Al-Uluhiya. That you worship Allah upon sincerity. And all three aspects of Tawheed in reality. Al-Rububiya, Al-Uluhiya, Al-Asma wa Sifat. As we'll see now. That all three aspects of Tawheed are within this statement. So that which it necessitates is that you implement all three acts uh, all aspects of Tawheed. So that's the one who gets the happiness of this life and the hereafter, the Shaykh says. The one who says it, knowing its meaning, and acting upon its rec- its uh, what it necessitates. Then the Shaykh mentions a statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in the explanation. He says, قَالَ الشَّيْخِ ibn Taymiyyah رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَنْ اِعْتَقَدَ أَنَّهُ بِمُجَرَّدْ تَلَفُّضِهِ بِالشَّهَادَةِ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَا يَدْخُلُ النَّارِ فَهُوَ ضَالٌ مُخَالِفٌ لِلْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ That somebody who believes, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, somebody who believes 
that by just saying La ilaha illallah, just saying it, by just sitting there and saying La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, somebody who believes that just saying this testification, just saying this, this shahada, that in itself is sufficient for him to enter paradise and to stay away from hellfire. Somebody who believes that just saying the statement of La ilaha illallah is sufficient to get him into paradise and keep him away from the hellfire, then that person is what? Dalun. He is misguided. Mukhalifun lil kitabi wa sunnah wal ijma'. In opposition to the Quran and the sunnah and the consensus of the scholars. So the one who believes that just saying the statement of La ilaha illallah will enter him into paradise and keep him away from the hellfire. Then Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah says he is misguided and he is in opposition to what the Quran and the Sunnah teaches and what the consensus of the scholars is. And that is what we briefly mentioned. That it's not just about saying it, but rather it's knowing the meanings of what you're, what you're saying. Understanding what Uluhiyyah is, understanding what Rububiyyah is, understanding what Al-Asma'u Sifat is. Then saying it upon that understanding and then acting upon it. That which it necessitates. That which it necessitates from Tawheed. Not that you know its meaning and you say it, but then you carry on going and making tawaf around the shrines and the graves. So you act upon it also afterwards. So there now the Shaykh has mentioned the rights of it, which is to fulfill the commandments and stay away from the prohibitions. The Shaykh has mentioned the benefit of it, which is the happiness of this life and the hereafter. Now the Shaykh is going to mention the virtues of it. What are the virtues and the rank and the status of this statement, La ilaha illallah? وَأَمَّا فَضْلُهَا فَقَدْ تَكَافَرَتَ الْأَحَادِيثِ فِي فَضْلِ هَذِي الْكَلِمَةِ The Shaykh says, as for the virtues of La ilaha illallah, then there are many narrations, many hadith which speak about the virtues of this shahada. From amongst them is the hadith of Ibadat ibn Samit, المُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ The hadith which is in Al-Bukhari, a Muslim. He says, أَنَّ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ قَال that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عَبْدَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ كَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمَ وَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمَ وَرُوحٌ مِنْهُ وَأَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ حَقٌّ وَالنَّارَ حَقٌّ أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنَ الْعَمَلِ In this hadith, the hadith of Ubadah ibn Samit, he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says, whoever testifies, whoever testifies to La ilaha illallah, that there is no deity worthy of worship in truthfulness except Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, him alone without any partners. And that the Prophet Muhammad is his slave and messenger. And that Isa is the slave of Allah and his messenger. وَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمَ وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُ And he is uh, like the, the soul which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew into Maryam via Jibreel from amongst the souls that Allah had created. And that the paradise is real and the hellfire is real. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter him into paradise regardless of what his actions are or upon whatever actions he is upon. The meaning of the hadith it indicates therefore that a person who says La ilaha illallah who testifies to it, i.e. knowing its meanings and saying it and acting upon it, the one who does all of that, and the hadith itself indicates an affirmation which will come to later anyway though, but the one who says all of that, knowing its meaning, acting upon it, and he affirms that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is the slave of Allah and his messenger. And here the scholars they mention a point, a point of benefit from this. The hadith says, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And that Muhammad, he also testifies that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. The two things put together are extremely beneficial. They have extreme benefit to it because it refutes many of the people of innovation to say this testification that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's slave and messenger. It refutes two extremes. When you say that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's slave and messenger, by saying that Allah, the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's slave, you are refuting those people who went to an extreme with regards to the rights of the Prophet 
So they began to say that the Prophet ﷺ, he's made out of light and that he doesn't have a shadow. Often you hear this. Many of the people they say there is hadith, there is this, there is that. It says that the Prophet ﷺ, he was made out of light and that he doesn't have a shadow. Then this in reality is extremism. Because there is no narration whatsoever which indicates that the Prophet ﷺ was made out of light. Neither is there any narration which indicates that he never used to have a shadow. And in fact the permanent committee of Saudi Arabia, the likes of Sheikh bin Baz and the others, the major scholars of our time, they all concluded that. And they all mentioned that in a fatwa. That it is no, there is no evidence whatsoever for this claim. And this is ghulu. It is exaggeration. Yes, we say that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is the best of creation. He is the best of creation, he is the best of mankind, he is the seal of the prophets, he was given the final revelation. We, are, we accept all of that, but we do not go to an extreme where we, whereby we raise the prophet over and above that which has been mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. Because loving the prophet is sticking to the limits set by the prophet himself. But to go over and above those limits, then in reality you are not loving that person. To love a person, you stick to the limits they give you. Someone tells you do X, Y and Z, to show your love for that person, you stick to those limits he gives you. But to go beyond the limits, and to go into exaggeration over and above what he requested you to do, and to start going into doing things which he never wanted you to do, then that's not you showing your love for that person anymore. Now you're going beyond the boundaries of what he requested. So similarly with the Prophet ﷺ, we do not go beyond the boundaries of what we've been taught. So we were not taught in any case, in any hadith or any ayah of the Qur'an that the Prophet is made out of light. Neither were we taught in any way that he does not have a shadow. Rather the Prophet used to say himself, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بشر. I am a human like you are humans. I am a human as you are humans. But he is the best of the humans. Similarly in one hadith the Prophet he mentioned, لَا تُطْرُونِ كَمَا أَطْرَةِ النَّصَارَ عِيسَى بِنَ مَرْيَمْ He said, don't raise me. Just like the Christians, they raised Isa alayhi salam. Don't raise me to this extent and don't give me this rank and status and make me so big and high, just like the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam was the messenger who was sent to them, which will come here now. وَأَنَّ Isa abdullahi wa rasuluhu That Isa is also the slave of Allah and his messenger. So he was the slave of Allah and the messenger of Allah. But those people at that time, some of them, they exaggerated to such an extent but they began to say, no, he's not just the slave of Allah and the messenger of Allah. He is Allah himself. And he has attributes and characteristics of Allah in him. So they exaggerated. And they went to an extreme. So the Prophet ﷺ said in that hadith, don't go to this exaggeration and this extreme and raise me to this level as the Christians did with Isa ﷺ. Because that is incorrect. And that is incorrect. Similarly, there's lots of hadith with this meaning. The Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke about his grave, he said, لا تتخذوا قبري عيدا. Don't take my grave as an Eid. What does it mean, don't take my grave as an Eid? This was all a part of it. This was all a part of the Prophet ﷺ's message, not to go into exaggeration with his rights. Yes, we love the Prophet ﷺ. He's more beloved to us than anyone else. More beloved to us than our fathers and our, and our children and our whoever. Our families and the people, as the hadith mentions. None of you truly believes until I'm more beloved to him than his own father, his children, and all of the people. Many narrations of that nature, and he's the best of the people, the best of creation. But to go to this extreme, no. In one hadith, the Prophet said, لا تتخذوا قبري عيدا. Don't take my grave as an Eid. What does it mean? Don't take my grave as an Eid. Place of worship. More specific though, correct. But more specifically as well, Eid. Why Eid then? Correct, all that's correct. But hmm. It's close. Exactly. Eid in the Arabic language, Eid, it comes from Aada Ya'udu. Or Aada Ya'idu. Something which is repetitive. It comes again and again and again. It comes back. That's why Eid is called Eid. It comes back. Every year after Ramadan, Eid is there. Do you ever have a Ramadan and Eid doesn't turn up? Eid comes every year after Ramadan, Eid comes every year in Hajj. It returns at the same fixed time every year. So it's something which is repetitive. Repetitive, without fail, twice a year. Once at the end of Ramadan, once at Hajj time. Twice a year it repeats itself. Repetitive, that's what Eid means in Arabic. Something which is repetitive. So in this hadith when the Prophet said, don't take my grave as an Eid, don't, 
come to my grave and visit it on this repetitive and scheduled basis. As some of the people they do now. Some of the people they say, you have to visit the grave of the Prophet every Friday. So from the neighboring regions, from the regions that are close by, you see some of the people they make a journey specifically every Friday. They say every Friday we have to visit the Prophet's grave. Or they say every uh, middle of the month, in the middle of the month, every month you have to go and visit the grave of the Prophet. So they have fixed schedules and timetables and repetitive visits that they make. That is which is prohibited from. That is what the Prophet said prohibited from. He said, don't make my grave this scheduled timetable of repetitive visits once every day after Fajr, once every uh, day after uh, uh, every Jum'ah. To have this repetitive schedule is not from the Sunnah. And the companions never used to do that. They used to go at random times. It's mentioned about some of them, if they came back from a journey, they would go and visit it. At random times. Not to have this schedule that every day after Fajr or every day after Al-Asr, that they go. And all of that was from this aspect of not going into ghulu, not going into this exaggeration and extremism with regards to the Prophet ﷺ, as the people they do now. It is exaggeration and extremism to say, we have to visit the grave after, every day after Fajr, or you have to go every day after Jum'ah. Then this is extremism. So all of these narrations, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned them as a refutation of those people who went into extremism, or the meanings which can be extracted from them as part of their benefits is that. That the extremism people have gone into. And this is an evidence for that also. That Muhammadan Abduhu, he is the slave of Allah. He's not made from light. He's not, uh, as some of the people say, he was the first thing which was created. Then from the light of his creation, everything else was created, and all these things that they say. All these narrations are unfounded. But then next to it, it says Abduhu wa Rasuluhu. He is his slave. So we don't go into exaggeration. Wa Rasuluhu. And he is his messenger. Meaning this is a refutation of those people who went to the other extreme and they didn't give the Prophet ﷺ his due right. They fell short. The first group of people went to an extreme. They went above the rights of the Prophet ﷺ. The second group of people, there are those who fall short. They don't fulfill the rights of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's a refutation of them. The first one, Abduhu, he is his messenger, he is his slave. Therefore proving that he is human as we are human. He is the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we are the slaves of Allah, but he is the best of the creation. So we don't go into exaggeration. That's a refutation of the people who go into exaggeration. But he is still the messenger of Allah. He is still the best of creation. He still has the rights upon us. He is still more beloved to us than anyone else. So that is a refutation of those people who fall short with regards to the rights of the Prophet ﷺ. And they don't give the complete rights of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's what the scholars they mention with regards to this statement. By putting the two together, وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ That the Prophet Muhammad is his slave and messenger. It's a refutation of those who go to an extreme and a refutation of those who fall short. And in reality, it's a refutation of the other sects too. The sects of the Christians and the sects of the Jews, how they used to behave with their prophets with extremism, some of them with extremism and some of them falling short. The Christians, they went to extremism. So they raised Isa a.s. to the status of God. As they said, that he has attributes of Allah in him. And as for the Jews, they fell short. So they accused their prophets. They accused their prophets of uh, blameworthy acts such as fornication and drinking alcohol and all sorts of things of that nature. They accused their prophets of these things. So they fell short. So even with the other religions, it's a refutation of them. وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عَبْدَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ There is a specific mention of Isa a.s. That he is also Abdullah, the slave of Allah. وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ He is the slave of Allah and the messenger of Allah. So again, no extremism and no falling short. He is one of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the Ulul Azm, one of the great messengers of Allah. And we accept that, we believe in that, and we don't go to any exaggeration. As the people, they fell into exaggeration. Even at the time of Ali, عنه, you know the story. At the time of Ali, عنه, some of those people, they fell into such extremism as a consequence of following those Jews. They fell into such extremism, they began to say that Ali عنه, has some aspects of uluhiyah in him. So when Ali عنه, found out about this, he gathered them up and he killed them all. And that was by consensus of the, uh, the, the companions at the time. Consensus of all of the companions at the time when they found out that there are certain people who were saying that Ali radiallahu anhu had some uluhiyah in him, 
It was their consensus that they should be killed. The manner in which they were killed, they, they differed about, but it was consensus that they should be killed. And Ali radiallahu anhu, he burnt them all. So these are evidences about staying into that middle path, not going into exaggeration and not falling short. And then further description is given of uh, Isa alayhi salam, وَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمَ وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُ That he is one of the slow souls that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, and then that soul was blown into Maryam alayhi salam. وَأَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ حَقٌ وَالنَّارُ حَقٌ And that the hellfire, the paradise and the hellfire, they are reality. That, that is to be believed in. They are reality and they exist right now in opposition to the people of innovation who say that they don't exist yet and they are going to be created on the Day of Judgment. That's incorrect. The hellfire and paradise are already created and they already exist. Then a person who does all of that, this is the point of the hadith, a person who believes in all of that, accepts all of that, understands all of that, acts upon all of that, then his reward is, أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنَ الْعَمَلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter him into paradise regardless of the level of acts that he's done. The scholars say, what does that mean? Regardless of the level of acts that he's done. Meaning the level. Some of the scholars said it indicates the level of paradise. That whatever acts he's done, he'll go into paradise just in accordance to the level of acts he's done. But the point is the fact that he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and he believes in all these statements that we've made, and he acts upon them, and he understands them, then that's sufficient for him to enter paradise, whichever level he enters into. So that is a great virtue of La ilaha illallah. And there's many hadith, many hadith about the virtues of La ilaha illallah. A famous hadith of the man with the 99 evil scrolls. Famous hadith, hadith al bitaqa That man who comes on the day of judgment, he has 99 scrolls full of evil deeds. Each scroll, when you roll it out, it's as far as the eyesight can see. That's what the hadith mentions. Each scroll, when you roll it out, it keeps rolling out and out and out, as far as the eye can see. You can't even see the end of it, as far as the eye can see. 99 of those, full of evil deeds. Then he has one scroll. One scroll with La ilaha illallah written in it. When they are put onto the weighing scales, those 99 scrolls, as far as the eye can see, onto one side, and the La ilaha illallah onto the other side, what happens? The La ilaha illallah goes heavy, and those others fly up. So that again shows you the great virtue of La ilaha illallah. They mentioned concerning this individual, he used to be upon shirk, he used to be upon evil all his lifetime, but at the end of his lifetime, he accepted La ilaha illallah, believing in it, accepting it in its meanings, etc. So on the Day of Judgment, he is saved as a consequence. So all of these are the ben- the virtues of La ilaha illallah. Here the Shaykh mentions a point, which is the word Allah, La ilaha illallah, that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Some of the people they say or they believe that the word Allah itself, just that word Allah, is an act of worship. Some of the people they believe that word by itself is an act of worship. So they say Allah, Allah, Allah. And eventually when they say it quickly, it becomes Allahu, Allahu, who, who, who. Eventually it becomes just who, who, who. This is what they do. They say Allahu, 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 like this. And they believe that's an act of worship. Just that one word by itself from the shahada. The reality, the shaykh says, is that one word by itself is not an act of worship. That one word by itself is not an act of worship. It doesn't hold any correct meaning by itself. The correct meaning is within the statement. La ilaha illallah. But to say Allahu by itself, Allahu, 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 and eventually they get to the stage where it just becomes the who, 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 then all of this is not an act of worship, it is not from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So those people who now sit in circles and they hold hands and they turn the lights off or whatever else, and then they sit there saying Allahu, 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 then this is not evidenced in the Qur'an and the Sunnah in any way, and neither is it any act of worship which is prescribed. The Shaykh says if a kafir was to spend his whole life sitting there saying Allah, 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 his whole life, a kafir could sit there his whole life saying Allah, 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 and he would die still as a kafir. That one word will not enter him into Islam. It is the La ilaha illallah, the full testification and knowing its meanings and acting upon it and saying it. As for the word Allah by itself, that will not enter a person into Islam. Then the Shaykh says, as for the nullifiers of La ilaha illallah, the nullifiers, again, that's a separate book in of itself. Shaykh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, he has a book called Nawaqid al Islam. It's a whole separate book all by itself. Here the Shaykh just mentions in brief. That obviously there are certain acts which nullify, negate, and they wipe out your la ilaha illallah. At the head of them is shirk, obviously. A shirk billah. As the Prophet ﷺ said in the famous hadith, Ijtanibu sab'al mubiqat. Stay away from the seven destroying sins. 
Stay away from the seven destroying sins. The first of them, ash-shirku billah. And then the rest of them are mentioned as sihr, magic, and etc., etc. The rest of them are mentioned. But at the head of them is shirk. And from amongst that is magic, and all those things which are linked to magic, and all the other aspects of major shirk. Then the shaykh is going to explain something about the meaning of La ilaha illallah from the linguistic point of view. Linguistically speaking, La ilaha illallah, La is La unnafia lil jins. That's what they call it in Arabic. For those who understand Arabic or learning it as, a, as an extra benefit, they call it La unnafia lil jins. Meaning, it negates every single item which comes underneath it. So when you say La ilaha, So la ilaha, they call this la unnafiya lil jins, meaning every item which comes underneath it is negated. Every single item, it, it it encompasses absoluteness. So when you say la ilaha, there is no deity, it indicates every single possible deity you could think of, whether it's a tree or a stone or a book or a pencil or whatever. Any deity besides Allah subhanahu wa taala is included within that statement. La ilaha illallah. La annafiya lil jins, meaning it eradicates every single item within it. So la ilaha, there is no deity, i.e. not any type of deity, any category of deity, any version of a deity, anything. Whatever deity you have, it's within that statement, la ilaha. There is no deity worthy of worship and truthfulness, illallah except Allah. That's what they call la annafiya lil jins, meaning it negates absolutely. Finally, the Shaykh is going to say now, he says, as for what La ilaha illallah necessitates, what you can extract from it, what you can extract from it. And the Shaykh says, what you can extract from it is clearly all aspects of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Tawheed al-Rububiyya, how is that extracted from La ilaha illallah? It's not easy one. Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. How does it indicate Tawheed al-Uluhiyya? There is no deity worthy of worship in truthfulness except Allah. Clear that only Allah is the one to be worshipped with your worship. You make your worship sincerely for the sake of Allah. All your worship directed to Allah alone. That's al-Uluhiyya. How, what about the rest of them? al asma sifat you could say because the name Allah is there. Allah is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on top of the fact, more specifically than that, that... If you affirm al-uluhiyya that only Allah has the right to be worshipped, only Allah has the right to be worshipped in truthfulness, all your worship has to be to Allah, that necessitates, it must be the case, it must be the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has names and attributes. Because otherwise you would end up being like the mu'attila who worship nothingness, as Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah said about them. They say their God, their Allah has no names, no attributes. Therefore they are worshipping nothingness. How do you describe nothing? It's nothing. Therefore, if you're going to affirm the uluhiyya of Allah from la ilaha illallah, it necessitates you must affirm the names and attributes of Allah. How else are you going to affirm that Allah has the right to be worshipped if you haven't already affirmed that Allah has names and attributes? And from that it leads on to the rububiyya then. If you're affirming the uluhiyya of Allah, then obviously you must be affirming the rububiyya of Allah. How else would you say that Allah has the right to be worshipped and all of our worship has to be singled out to Allah if you don't affirm that it is actually Allah who is the Rabb? He is the one who created the heavens and the earth and the one who gives life and death. If you haven't affirmed that, then how are you going to affirm the Uluhiyya in the first place? 
So the point is, all three aspects of Tawheed are within it and they're all linked. And you can't break them up. It's not possible to break up the aspects of Tawheed. We'll just finish off on the relationship between the three aspects of Tawheed. What is the relationship between the three aspects of Tawheed specifically? How is Rububiya linked to Uluhiya? How is Rububiya linked to Uluhiya? What's the link? We've done it before once. You know, you know that Allah has Tawheed Rububiya, then He should be like, uh, you should affirm uh, Tawheed Rububiya. How do you say in Arabic? Rububiya is the same as Rububiya. So they say that the relationship of uh, Rububiya to Uluhiya is that Rububiya it necessitates Al Uluhiya. If you believe that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth, He gives life and death, He gives provisions, He is the controller of all of everything that you see, He is the Lord of everything. If you affirm all of that, then it necessitates, you have to give your worship to Him. Would it make sense that you say that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth and gives life and death and provisions and food and rain, but I'm going to worship someone else instead? Does it make sense? So Rububiya, it necessitates al uluhiyah If you affirm and you uh, accept Rububiya, you have no choice. You have to accept al uluhiyah then. How are you going to say Allah, yes, He creates and gives life and death and everything, but I'm not going to worship Him. It doesn't make sense. So Rububiya, it necessitates al uluhiyah That's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses Rububiya so much. The kuffar, the mushrikeen, they used to accept Rububiya. The prophets and messengers never had problems with their people with regards to Rububiya. The people used to accept Rububiya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those examples of rububiyyah in the Qur'an because it's known that the mushrikeen, they used to accept it. So if they used to accept that, it necessitates they have to accept uluhiyah. What about the other way around? What's the relationship of uluhiyah to rububiyyah? Rububiyyah to uluhiyah, rububiyyah necessitates uluhiyah. Uluhiyah to rububiyyah... Ah. Don't say in English. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what's the relationship between uh, Uluhi and Rububiya? The other way around. We're out of time, we'll have to do it. Or should we leave it as a... As a go ahead, we'll leave it as a question. Prayer is going to be one minute. That's the question for next week. What's the relationship between Uluhiya to Rububiya? From Rububiya to Uluhiya, we just said it. Rububiya necessitates al Uluhiya. But the other way around. If you're looking at it from the perspective of Uluhiya to Rububiya, backwards, that way around, what's the what do you call that relationship? What do you call that a relationship? The Rububiya to Uluhiya one necessitates. Rububiya necessitates Uluhiya. The other way around, Uluhiya to Rububiya, what do you call that? That's the homework for next week, inshallah. Find out what the link is between Al Uluhiya to Rububiya. Was there one for last week? Oh, the, the line. That's only one line. It takes two, 10 seconds to memorize it. <laughs> now, next week, I think, uh, Isha 7.30, yeah? Oh. Uh, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. <coughs> so, should we do after Isha? After Isha, huh? 7.30? 7 o'clock. 7 So next week, Saturday, it's going to be 8 o'clock, Isha, the Jama'ah. Okay, so in that case, the lesson we'll do after Isha. Straight after Salat al-Isha. Salat al-Isha is going to be 8 o'clock. So we'll start the lesson maybe quarter past 8, inshallah. If there's any changes, it'll come on the email and the text or whatever. No.